up, everybody? It's your man, Lukey, and I am back with one of my good friends in the boxing industry and the host of the Fighter's Voice um, boxing program and outlet. You can watch them on YouTube on Tuesday and Wednesday night live. Great content. Richard Ortiz, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me, Lukey. I appreciate it. Oh, it's always fun, and plus, like, the fun of the quarantine, not that there's much fun, is we can go revisit old fights and old fighters and talk about why we love the sport of boxing. And you always bring up Tommy Hearns. I'm not the most familiar with Tommy Hearns. I did a deep dive on him, but I want to start this before we go through the whole history. What was your first memory of Tommy Hearns, and what drew you to him as a fighter? Uh, my first memory was actually it was the day before my birthday, August 2nd. Um, Tommy Hearns taking up at Pino Cuevas, I believe it was 1980 or, or late 81. I believe it was 1980, yes, uh, August 2nd, and uh, got to see Tommy Hearns fight for the very first time against Pepino Cuevas, who was at that time one of the best. Uh, he was actually WBA, WBA welterweight champion, one of the best left hookers in, in the game uh, coming out of Mexico. And uh, Tommy Hearns used his reach and his power and just got him out of there, I believe, the second round. And that all stood out to me on how a challenger – took a championship fight and dominated the champion. That's, that's what got me hooked. And how, because that, how, how lanky and skinny he was, but the power he generated. Because that was his fight at the Joe Louis Arena, right, where he won his first world title? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, because I'm doing a little I'm doing a little homework here. I didn't live the era fully, but my first memory of Tommy Hearns was when Martin Lawrence got in the ring with him and got punched by him. <laughs> that was kind of my – it sounds funny, but that really was my introduction to Tommy Hearns as an avid watcher of television as a child. I go, oh, this guy Tommy Hearns must be really, really scary if he beat up uh, Martin Lawrence. Yeah, I remember that episode. I actually got an old-school VHS tape because I recorded the when he, was, he made his appearance there. Yep. Very so uh, let's start with um, kind of my first impression when going through his career – Obviously, he's from Detroit, Michigan. He's probably the most iconic Kronk fighter, and his career is probably the reason Kronk, Jim, and Emmanuel Stewart is uh, viewed so highly. You know, um, I think that a lot of his greatness leads up to that. He won the National Amateur Athletic Union light welterweight title in 1977. He also was a 1977 National Golden Gloves lightweight champion. Basically, he had done a lot of things on the early amateur scene. I think, like you, like myself, you probably didn't follow Tommy Hearns as an amateur. No, no. Uh, I wish I would have because there was some great showdowns with him and Aaron Pryor, and he fought some other uh, future champions. But, uh, no, um, you know, we didn't have Google back then. We didn't have the resources we have today to follow him. And um, just him coming up as a pro, I was able to follow him and uh, give him credit where a lot of people didn't give him credit because he was overshadowed. And I'll talk about it later on in the show. He was overshadowed by Sugar Ray Leonard. Yeah, because uh, Leonard was just coming out of the Olympics with with the gold medal. Because it says here that he finished his amateur career at 155 and 8, which that's pretty much like a pretty top notch with it. He turns pro. He goes. um, It's him and Emmanuel Stewart. And the first thing that I look at when I look at Tommy Hearns is there's a few things. He's he's ridiculously tall and long for the welterweight division, but he's also a ridiculously big puncher. He punches with both hands, and he's also prone to lean in and give up his distance. Those are the things that stand up, and he's easy to hit at times because he wants to kind of he believes so much in his power. What are the things that stand out to you about the Motor City Cobra? Well, there's a lot of things, and he actually he didn't even learn how to really tie up until after the first uh, Sugar Ray Leonard fight, which he didn't uh, utilize those tactics against Marvin Hagler when he was hurt later on in that first round. But what stands out to me is Emmanuel Stewart and Tommy Hearns, which they made each other. Emmanuel Stewart didn't show up one day and say, hey, I'm the best trainer ever in, in history. He had a great fighter, and he was committed to that fighter, and that was, uh, of course, Tommy Hearns. They had a game plan coming out of the amateurs, and that, and that game plan was, look, Sugar Ray Leonard's coming out. He's getting all the limelight, all the exposure, everything that a, a, a fighter can dream of, he's having it. So their plan was we have to start a string of knockouts. We need knockouts. Tommy Hearns wasn't 
a huge puncher in the amateurs. He became a huge puncher in the, in the in the pros, and it was that right hand. So he had to get a string of knockouts. I spoke to Emmanuel, the late great Emmanuel Stewart personally, and we talked about Tommy Hearns, Michael Warren, et cetera. And he said, Richard, I needed him to get some exposure, and that was by him knocking people out. You're absolutely yeah. right how he let people close the distance at times. That was one of uh, a few flaws along with some people are born with a chin and some people are not. Well, I don't, I don't think that Tom, and we'll get into this because I want, I'm gonna, we're going to do the deep dive. I don't think Tommy had a bad chin. I think that's going to be um, one of my hot takes. I think it's just that sometimes he'd let people get on the inside on him and he was more prone to take a clean shot because I think that outside of four or five fighters ever, most people can't take a clean shot. And Tommy just would put himself in situations where he might have to take a bigger punch than other people have to. No, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, a lot of people, we're, we're so used to uh, the granite chins of the world, you know. And when we don't, we see a normal chin, we, we want to say you really can't take a, a, a shot. And we're talking about an 8 ounce or 10 ounce glove uh, hitting the human jaw and skull as well. Um there was times when, when he did give up the jab, and, and by him giving up the jab, he allowed them to get the proper distance to be effective against Tommy Hearns. One thing we talked about is power. One thing he didn't get too much credit for, uh, Tommy Hearns was a great, excellent – I mean, he was an excellent boxer. I mean, he showed that against uh, Sugar Ray Leonard in the, in the late rounds in their first fight, and he showed it against uh, Virgil Hill. Um, just one thing, and I'm probably um, skipping ahead, Styles make fights. He just could not outbox Iran Barkley. Iran Barkley had his number, plain and simple. Period. Yeah, I mean we're getting we're getting a little ahead there, but like that, I think that's kind of like how Vernon Forrest had Shane Mo- Mosley's number, but then Mayorga had Vernon Forrest's number. Some guys just are someone's kryptonite. Well, I, I think uh, Tommy Hearns was Sugar Ray's kryptonite. Yeah, but- I. I really believe that as well, you know, as controversial as that statement was. So when uh, Tommy Hearns wins this first world title, you're in attendance, and he basically treats a world champion like he's not even on his level, which is a statement we rarely see. We don't even see that with most modern fighters. When you saw that, did you realize you're looking at kind of like a future great? I, I knew that he had a game plan, and I knew that, you know what, Right away, I mean, I wanted him, as soon as he won that fight, I, I want, okay, when's he going to fight Sugar Ray Leonard? That's what I was looking at. And you knew you witnessed something special. And uh, my mom watched the fight with me, and she gave him a nickname. Uh, she goes, she called him Daddy Longlegs, only because of his frame. I said, look, Mom, the, the fighter's coming on. She goes, which one? And I'll say Daddy Longlegs, which was Tommy the Hitman Hearns, you know, at 147. Um, you just knew there was something special there. I mean, you really did, because of his power and, and mainly his confidence. Yeah, I mean, there's something about him that a lot of all-time great fighters have where he's just iconic, right? It's like you look at his frame, and he nearly looks like an anorexic man with a big afro. And just a not to say that he's like an unattractive guy or anything, but just a funny-looking face. Like he'd stand out in most places, and it's just this weird frame of a guy, this weird face, and then his temperament is basically to stop you. So it's just like this – just this iconic person, and you contrast that with Sugar Ray Leonard where every statement is micromanaged and he, yeah. you don't ever feel like anything's coming out authentic, right? Because it's like everything's been workshopped and you're just getting like what people – what you think he wants you to hear. And Tommy Hearns is kind of like emblematic of Detroit, of a blue-collar city. He's just like, this is Tommy Hearns. This is what I am. I'm a working class guy. I'm going to get these knockouts to be that guy. And in 81, he, at Caesars Palace, the outdoor arena, he fights Sugar Ray Leonard in what I think is probably one of the three best fights I've ever seen. I know I watched it for about seven years straight with my grandpa on Comcast. Whenever I'd visit him, he'd put, say, put on Hearns Leonard, and me and him would watch it. But um, the, talk, let's talk about this fight because this is one of the – the best fight. The re, I'll say why I say it's the best fight, and then I'll let you wrap. Why I say it's one of the best fights is the each fighter trades what they're doing in the fight at different times. Hearns has to box. Hearns pressures. Leonard 
pressures, Leonard boxes. And the only thing was Hearns gets rocked a little bit, and Leonard was one of these all-time great finishers. And it's just one of those controversial endings where Hearns was Hearns was up on the cards, and they stopped the fight. And it's going to be one of those debatable ones. But what do you remember about this fight? Well, first of all, I, the minute it was signed, the minute, the minute it was advertised, I was excited. And actually, I had to go old school and listen to that live on the radio because they had a closed circuit, but the area that we were in, Fresno, they were unable to make the connection. It, they finally said, hey, we're not able to bring you the fight. So they were just giving us updates on the radio. When I finally got to see it and also listen it on the radio, there was two to three parts to that fight. There was Tommy Hearns of meeting Sugar Ray Leonard in, in the middle of the ring. The press was going crazy taking pictures. Tommy Hearns was uh, able to, to neutralize Sugar Ray's speed with the jab and his movement and his power. Even though he, he did get hurt, he was able to show the whole world his boxing skills and win some rounds by outboxing Sugar Ray Leonard, the great Sugar Ray Leonard, giving him a boxing lesson. Uh, again, Sugar Ray had to work his way inside, and he hurt Tommy Hearns. Hearns this time was able to recover and, you know, get his legs back from underneath him and put on a boxing clinic. You're talking about the hitman who's used to knocking people out. Now he has to box. Usually when a fighter gets hit, okay, get a round in or two, get your legs back. But he didn't just take the round off. He was effective with his boxing ability. And in that 14th round, when he was hurt, honestly, to this day, I'm still thinking, why didn't Tommy Hearns um, say anything like, you know, they stopped the fight too soon? Uh, that's just because I've seen fights get stopped. It wasn't like he was taking punishment. But it, it was leading up to a Sugar Ray finish, but at the same time, Tommy Hearns was still in the punch. If you look at that replay before they stopped the fight, Tommy Hearns landed uh, two left hooks. And um, But at that time, you know, the referee had to come in and stop the fight. It was a very exciting fight. To this day, one of my favorites. And um, anybody at this point, it's like one of those. Could watch that the, fight. The finish of that fight is very unsettle, unsettling to me. Because it's a fight that felt like if you let it go a little longer, it was going to settle itself out. That's just how I feel. Well, I, I think so. And you got to remember those 15 rounds back then in 1981. And there's a lot of fighters, a lot of corners. They, they don't know what to do to motivate their fighter. They don't know what to do to get them to that next level because they've never been in that situation. And the late, great Angelo Dundee, as you all know, and the rest is history, he kept telling Sugar Ray you're blowing it, son, you're blowing it, which means, come on, you're letting this thing go. And you got to remember, Sugar Ray Leonard was a one-eyed fighter. So that's why he's great. That's why he's a Hall of Famer. He did what he needed to do to put himself at risk into that punching zone and land those big, powerful shots that, that hurt Tommy and eventually got the referee to stop the fight. So there was two turn of events in, in that fight. Yeah, I mean it, it was it was something. So then, uh, ha- or not Hagler Hearns? I get so confused sometimes. I want to. Yeah. You think of the three greats of the air, Leonard, Hagler, and Hearns, but sometimes you'll say Hag or I'll say Hagler instead of Hearns just because it rolls off the tongue. But yeah. we get to 154, so he moves up in weight. The mm-hmm. co- and I love the nickname the Motor City Cobra. I know everyone likes the Hitman. But when yeah. you watch him fight, he coils up like a cobra. Yeah, and when he does. He, so, like, to me, that I, I prefer that nickname more because he really does – his body resembles that of a snake. And the power he possesses is very similar to a cobra. So it's kind of bittersweet to me that he's more known for being the hitman instead of the cobra because I feel like the cobra really is emblematic of what he was in the ring. I, I agree with you, and if you look at his back, it, it's wide just like a cobra. And I'm not getting ahead, but I'm just I'm just touching bases since we talked about that. I believe it was the third uh, third round of the rematch for Sugar Ray Leonard when they both threw right hands. When he hurt Sugar Ray Leonard, he he jiggled and made a form like a cobra, like a snake. If you look at his back and his wingspan, they just opened up for a second, and then he threw that right hand over the top. So I wish they would have kept it, but the the hitman is what people wanted to hear, what people wanted to see. It was more marketable. But I always, I always address him as Tommy the Hitman Hearns, a.k.a. The, the Motor City Cobra, when I got the opportunity to meet him or post a story about Tommy Hearns. Uh, you talk about 154. <clears throat> Benitez, uh, the Superdome, New yep, Orleans. Real for, yep, real for Benitez. And you got to remember, prior to that, there was already talks of him and Marvin Hagler. There was already talks about that fight, which was scheduled to uh, take place um, 
Tommy Hearns hurt his pinky, so it was actually going to come on HBO, and uh, they had to postpone that fight. But, yeah, that was a great fight. That was an awesome fight. That fight, it gets overlooked. That is a great fight. We're talking about both men going down, both men hurting each other. Both men were in the fight. Again, that particular fight, Tommy Hearns showed his power and mainly his boxing ability and just his wits because he had a game plan. He knew he wanted to outshine Sugar Ray Leonard because the poster boy was Sugar Ray Leonard, the gold medal, the titles, the commercials, the big contract. And what he wanted to do at that point, he wanted to make boxing history. He wanted to become the first man ever to win four titles in four different weight divisions. Well, he's fighting for the WBC super welterweight title, so 154 pounds. Wilfred Benita is like a Hall of Famer in his own right. So this is not just like stepping up and fighting the most vulnerable champion. He's fighting one of the harder guys in the division. And what I liked about rewatching this fight on top of it being fun is people are really wondering if his power will carry up. <laughs> like I love watching these old fights and yeah. in hindsight and they're like, we we're making sure like, we're not sure if his power is going to hold up. And you're like, I'm say, sitting here in hindsight. I'm like, I think it, I think Tommy Hearns, power is going to be okay at 154. You know what? That was always the question. I'm glad you brought that up. That gets so overlooked now. It, it, it's like finding out now, hey, can Superman really fly? Or is wrestling really real or is it fake? I'm not sure. Back then, you know, we, we would ask that question, and people would, would believe uh, the press, believe what, what people would say. And, you know, when the press would say, hey, I'm not sure if that power, if, he, if he's able to bring that power up with him, you got to remember the man was six foot one. So, yes, that power went on great. All he did was probably eat an extra slice of pizza to make that weight. He was chiseled, uh, no body fat on the man. He brought that power with him. Well, no, I think it's also like let's look at, and people might get mad for me comparing this, but let's look at Canelo. Canelo can basically go to whatever weight he wants to go to, and I'm not going to really question his power because he just knocked out one of the better light heavyweights. So, I mean, like, you know what I mean? And that's kind of how I look at Tommy Hearns. Tommy Hearns fought at light heavyweight, and I never really thought the power was an issue. No, I no, I, I agree. And uh, right before, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but right before he called it quiz, he was campaigning for a, a cruiserweight title, a legitimate cruiserweight title, and that's at, at 190s. And, you know, he did come in at like 185. First one was 183, 187. But, no, that was his whole um, desire and, and one of his uh, game plans that he wanted. He even mentioned one time, hey, I'm going to be the heavyweight champion of the world. So, I mean, for you as a fighter, as a man, to want the biggest prize in boxing, which is the heavyweight championship of the world, to even say that, I mean, it holds a lot of water. People may have took him serious. Some people probably took that lightly. At that time, I just, you know, it was just something to hear and listen to and, and be amazed by it. But let's get back to the 154. I believe that was, that, that was yeah. a true weight. That was a true uh Test for him at 154, and not only that, fighting uh, Benitez, and of course Benitez, being Benitez, he went up to Tommy Hearns and tried to stare him down, just like he did Sugar Ray Leonard. And um, Benitez is a tough cat, one of the best counter punchers in in the sport. So he didn't just have somebody handed to him; it was a legitimate fighter, Hall of Famer, and Benitez uh, put on a good performance. Uh, my comparison, and this will get people mad, I'd compare Wilfred Benitez. To Hector Macho Camacho, as weird as that sounds. Really durable, really tough, counter puncher, good defensive fighter, and you just had to be on your A game to beat him. Yeah. You, you know, I'm not sure Benitez had that nickname, but he would call himself the Dragon. After some, some uh, interviews, and I remember he would call himself, I'm a Dragon. Whatever that man at the time, man, it just, you know, it, it, it fired him up, and he truly believed that he was that Dragon. But, uh, you know, he fought some good fights. And, you know, I don't want to get off, off the subject. He fought a good fight. you got to remember, he fought Roberto Duran. And that was a great fight. That was 15 rounds. And he gave Roberto Duran a, a boxing lesson. And I don't want to leave Roberto Duran, uh, Duran out of that top four. But, uh, like I said, Benitez was just no pushover. He fought the who's who in the sport. So we have Murray Sutherland and then Luigi Mancillo. And then we get to Roberto Duran at Caesars Palace. And... <laughs> Uh, what's his name? My man Tommy Hearns stops Roberto Duran in two rounds, and it actually took Roberto Duran five years after being knocked out by Tommy Hearns to the fight for another world title. So that's kind of a that was definitely a turning point 
in uh, Roberto Duran's career. I'm going to controversially say, like, between Wilfred Benitez, the first Sugar Ray Leonard fight, to Roberto Duran, this is probably the best version of Tommy Hearns. Well, that night he was not going to be denied. And there was, there was a, like I said, there was a layout, there was a plan. That Marvin Hagler fight was in the air. Uh, he made a statement right after the fight. He said, right now Marvin's shaking, he's shaking like a leaf in the tree after watching the Tommy Hearns fight. And he made that statement to, to Marvin Hagler. Um, they both addressed the, the upcoming fight with them, that they were going to fight each other. It wasn't officially announced. It, it was uh, proposed, and they went back and forth. They went back and forth on, at, at a post-fight press conference. And Marvin Hagler, he really does it. He's not too vocal, but you're not going to come in at 160 and just think you're just going to cakewalk your way over here in my division. But uh, Tommy Hearns put, put on a statement. I mean, he made a statement, put on a show, and definitely earned that fight against Marvin Hagler, which was postponed, I believe, a year and a half before. That's about right. It's uh, Yeah, it's about a year or so. He fights Fred Hutchings in the process, a 27-1 and pro, stops him in three rounds, drops him twice in the first round, stops him in the third, and then vacates his WBC super welterweight title to move up to middleweight to fight Hagler for the WBC, WBA, and IBF middleweight world title. And what's crazy about this is during this time, and I wasn't around for this time, but I read about it, no one wanted to fight Hagler. So it's the guys that were smaller than Hagler moved up to fight Hagler. Well, Hagler, he, he pulled it out of you. He made you fight. You were not going to de- deny being in a fight. You are not going to – he was up there to box. He was there to just cut the ring off and make you work. I mean, fighting right-handed, left-handed, a chin. Uh, a lot of times there were some controversial decisions his way. I mean, his first, I believe, is Vito Adafermo. Uh, when he fought for the title, and I believe it was uh, called a draw when Hagler should have been awarded the fight. Uh, you know, you may check my history. I'm just going on uh, memory on, on what I known as, as a well, kid. I mean, that's the th- I remember, like, his first world title fight, he beats the guy up. It's a draw. Then he wins the world title, and it's in Britain, and people are booing him. Yeah, it's like, don't help out him, uh-huh. You're and then I, I believe that, He's the fighter that Joe Frazier told him that he's got everything against him. He's black. He's a southpaw, and he can actually fight. So, like, it's like you're talking about a guy that, like that basically his whole life is hardship, and people are kind of, like, looking for ways around him. He's not really, like, the most swagged-out dude. All he can do is fight. He's just really intense, but I can't really see, like, um, him being a guy that went to the club and knew how to do the dance moves, right? Hagler is the fighter's fighter, and it's like people just didn't want to fight him because it was just like a, a really intense guy. He, he was very intense. He was a tough, tough dude. He was no pushover at all what, whatsoever, but he was in the middle of, of that division. When I say the middle, the middleweight division was the division back then because history has it. Sugar Ray Robinson uh, controlled the middleweight division. Everybody wanted that middleweight division. Any welterweight at the time or junior welterweight dreamed of finishing their career as a middleweight division, as our fighters do today. It's the hottest division in the history of boxing, plain and simple period. We can argue all day about that. But well, it's Robinson, you know, Carlos like Monzon. Absolutely. And then you got, like, Hearns, Hagler, Leonard, and then Bernard Hopkins. And now Canelo, Golovkin. So you got a lot of these kind of all-time greats dancing around that division. Or at least competed and tasted that division, you know, at one point in their career. That That is the, the money division. Hagler controlled it. He he was the man at the time. He probably wasn't the, the, the poster boy of the Sugar Ray Leonard, the big smile. Like you said, didn't have that swag to uh, make commercials or any of the above. He didn't even start making commercials until after he beat Tommy Hearns. Well, I'll get, not to get political here, but I kind of view Marvin Hagler as, like, the black experience of life, like, of, like, prejudice or whatever, where, like, Ray Leonard is, like, if you're kind of the popular cool kid in school and you get to go to prom and everyone loves you, um, Marvin Hagler is, like, the dude that would get pulled over by the police that wears a black hoodie and he's just well, walking home. I'll, I'll, and that's, I'll, I'll, like, I'll, I'll, that's, like, the mentality he went through life with. I'll say this, okay? And I'm not comparing their actions at all whatsoever, period. I'm going to be careful how I, how I say this. Yeah. Sugar Ray Leonard was treated the way O.J. Simpson was treated in a white community, plain and simple, period. 
Now, take what you want from it or, or not. A lot of people didn't see Sugar Ray Leonard as an African-American. They just saw him as a great smile, great mannerism, and most of all, a gold medal. And that's just – and the guy can fight. Great chin, uh, boxing IQ, and, you know, he just put on a show. He was a performer. So he did what he needed to do in the boxing world. Marvin Hagler had to work hard, very, very hard. A lot of things were not given to him. So there was a little bit of bitterness, you know. I mean, Sugar Ray Leonard's first fight was fifty thousand dollars, his first professional fight, and you know, very well deserved coming out of the Olympics, gold medal. He earned that. Marvin Hagler, I don't even remember what the numbers were. So he went to, he traveled the road less traveled by, so to speak. And I'm not biting off any narration. It is what it is. I don't want to get off topic. No, no, no. I mean, it's interesting ha- because a lot of people listening, I don't, I think they've just heard like Marvin Hagler's name, but they don't associate a fight with him. They just assume pressure fighting. Tommy Hearns, they think long guy. Ray Leonard, they think all-time great. People might not associate characteristics. They just assume greatness. Well, well, they do. They, they, they do, and that's just, you know, a lot of people, they don't know, and, and if they're listening, they'll get schooled. And I say that of being as humble as possible. You know, Tommy Hearns is, you know, he gets overlooked. So does, Tommy, so does uh, Marvin Hagler. You know, and I'll say this right now, and not because it's Tommy Hearns. I'll, what I'm about to say about Tommy Hearns I'm, stands for Sugar Ray Leonard, possibly Marvin Hagler because he only stood at, at 160. Roberto Duran, too, at the lower weight would have eaten these young Walter weights up. Plain and simple, period. The only ones that would have been able to hang with him, honestly, and I'll say this right now, is the Manny Pacquiao's, the Floyd Mayweather's because of the game plan and being smart and also – Bud Crawford. I'll say Bud Crawford, but he still has not been tested in war battle field. But the other, See, the, the other, the other guys will, will not be able to compete. And I'm the not, thing I'm, about Hearns that's hard, like I think Floyd and Manny would have had a good chance with Hearns, but the thing about Hearns that I didn't remember from powers. watching tape, it's not even – it's the powers there, but for me what I forgot was when he thought he had you, you got 15 punches coming. And he'll give you a punch that you can land on him, but he's throwing a lot of punches. Like he, you talk about guys nowadays, you're lucky to see three punches come in succession. Um, Hearns could put at least 10 punches together, and they're each equal. It would be right hand, left to the body, right to the head, left uppercut. He's putting them together, and you're just, you got to figure out what to do. You know what? When I, I spoke to Emmanuel Stewart, if you notice, Tommy Hearns' left hand is very low, very, very low. And I remember talking to Emmanuel Stewart about that, and he said, no, no, he's rich. We kept our hand low to base him in for the right hand. We kept the left hand low purposely. You'll, you'll never see Tommy Hearns with his left hand up high, except for maybe the first two rounds to get Sugar Ray Leonard. But he would always drop the left hand to bait you to come in to drop his own right hand. Emmanuel Stewart was the only trainer that I was able to talk to that never trained to go the distance He trained for a knockout, and I have the honor and privilege of being able to talk to him, talk to him on the phone, talk to him in Vegas whenever I come across him, and we would chop it up, and he would kind of let me know what was going on, and he knew Tommy was my favorite fighter at at the time, and uh, that left hand low was to bait his opponent in to drop that right hand. Well, now, you can almost hear that. Remember when Emmanuel Stewart did the HBO commentary? Because there'd be points in fights where he'd be disgusted. Where he'd go, ah, he doesn't really want to go for it to get. He could probably get him out of here if he wanted to, yeah. but, but he's probably he doesn't want to do that. And I, I miss that a little bit because he'd be disgusted because he was a guy where he wanted his fighter. Remember the Klitschko cornering where he got in Klitschko's ass for not putting everything into that round. He's just sitting there yelling at him, and Klitschko had won the round, but he wanted Klitschko to stop the guy. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember that. No, th- those those are a couple scenes with Emmanuel Stewart on USA Network where he told this fighter, he said, you know what, you don't want to fight. He, you, know, he, you can look this up. He said, you know what, I'm going to go. I'm going to leave. I'm going to go have me a glass of wine because you don't want to fight. I don't want to say it's Obacar, but I think it might have been Obacar. I just know it was one of uh, Emmanuel Stewart's fighters. He said, hey, if you don't want to fight, that's fine. I'm going to go have a glass of wine. And he really meant it. I wasn't going to come out here and waste time. I remember I was talking to Emmanuel Stewart about uh, Michael Moore, and I said, he's kind of like, uh, I didn't want to use the, the, the term lazy. I said, he's kind of like, you know, lackadaisical. That's a, he goes, that's an understatement. That's what he told me. He said, basically ate his way out of the light heavyweight division. Didn't even go cruise away. 
cruiserweight went straight to a uh, heavyweight. So that's just some uh, um, some history, man, of some conversations that I had with the, the great Emmanuel Stewart, Tommy Hearns' trainer. Well, that's why we got you on here. So Marvin Hagler versus Tommy Hearns, probably my least favorite Tommy Hearns fight. I'm a big Tommy guy. This fight just felt like Tommy never got comfortable in this fight. Um, and Hearns just was just going to be on him the whole night. It, it's a great fight, but it's a really awkward fight. Like, I know that people talk about it being a legendary fight, but when you watch it, it's just really the battle of wills. That's the way I'd describe this fight. You, you can say that, but you know what? After maturity and watching a couple times for myself, for me, watching Tommy Hearns, it's a battle of survival. I think Marvin, and I'm a big Tommy Hearns fan. You know this, Luki. Marvin Hagler said to himself, you're not going to dictate the fight. You're not going to be the bully. I'm not going to run from you, give you the opportunity to set up. I only know one way to fight, and it's in your chest, and I'm going to take it right to you, and he did. Tommy Hearns didn't even get a chance to get set. He had no choice but to fight back, and then, you know, muscle memory came out. A little bit of the, the game plan came out, but in no shape or form was it the game plan to go there and trade with the stronger, uh, the legitimate middleweight, which was Marvin Hagler. I don't think that was in their game plan. I've never talked to Emmanuel Stewart or anybody else. What was the initial game plan? I heard there was rumors about his leg being massaged two hours before the walkout, which Emmanuel Stewart didn't um, agree with. Now, I would let, never leave my dressing room or want anything going on if I was the, the, the head trainer. So I don't know how true that statement was or what really happened. At the end of the day, he got in the ring with Marvin Hagler. Marvin Hagler was the better person, the stronger man, and the true champion that night. I was hoping Tommy Hearns would get some rounds from underneath him, you know, jab, move around. But Marvin Hagler didn't let Tommy Hearns breathe. Tommy Hearns had no choice but to fight back, and then it turned into survival mode. Yeah, it's one of these fights where it went from being an athletic competition to being how can you just try to survive? Like how can you – because it got to a point where Hagler took out the – not I shouldn't say the skill component, but he didn't want the smaller man to – well, I guess I'm saying back what you're already saying, but he didn't want us, him to set the terms of battle. And Hagler is the ultimate guy that thrives in chaos. So he just tried to bring the chaos as early and quickly as possible. Today, to this day, Hagler will argue with you that he's never been knocked down. Uh, there's, you know, on his record, it's ruled a knockdown, but if you look at it, you can see it. You can call it a slip or call it a knockdown. He had a granite chin, and he had to put himself, expose himself in that dangerous right hand and the counterpunching of that left hook with Tommy Hearns. He took the fight to Tommy Hearns. Tommy Hearns never had a chance to set up. Uh, he just never had a chance to relax, never had a chance to get in his rhythm. And, again, Tommy Hearns saw – I mean, Marvin Hagler saw something that, that night, that way, and said, you know what? I'm not here to just move around and get caught with something. I'm here to just, just – let's make it happen. And, and that's what he did. And I, I yeah. respect Hagler for that, too. I, I wanted to see a rematch. There was talk of a rematch after Sugar Ray Leonard and Tommy Hearns fought to, their, their rematch to a draw, but it never materialized. And it was supposed to take place at 168. Hagler didn't, was not going to move up to 168. He was going to still stay at 160. What I also think, and I'm going to do a Hagler podcast eventually, is a lot like I had an editor, um, Doug Fisher from Ring Magazine, on, and he compared Golovkin to – Marvin Hagler, and I guess that's kind of fair, but I, today I was watching Carlos Monzon, and to me, Carlos Monzon is much more of Golovkin than Marvin Hagler. I, I agree. But Marvin Hagler to me is, where I see the comparison is, Hagler wanted to stay at 160, Golovkin wanted to stay at 160. They both hit hard. But the thing with Hagler was Golovkin has an edge, and I have an episode with Michael Montero on Golovkin, and he spent years covering Golovkin and everything. Um, so it's interesting to hear about him. But Hagler had a different level of intensity coming into the ring that Golovkin never had, where it was like he he wanted to be the bully in the ring. He wasn't going to give you respect. He was going to take it from you. Whereas Golovkin, there's a level of sportsmanship that Hagler doesn't bring to the ring. Well, I mean, let's think of the footwork, too. I mean, Marvin Hagler didn't have the best, but he didn't have the worst. And I don't think Golovkin has Marvin Hagler's footwork. But um, Golovkin – I'd say say 
Golovkin has similar footwork, but his feet are very slow. So it's like, it's weird. Because that tripped me up. Because I, I originally thought Golovkin's footwork was bad. But it's not bad. It's just his feet are slow. They're much slower than Hagler's. But keep going. No, and I like the fact that Marvin Hagler can switch from some uh, right-handed to southpaw. And he throws punch, uh, punches and bunches. I mean, you know, he flurries, and he works every minute, every second of the round. And I can't say that about a lot of fighters, especially, you know, come of the last rounds of uh, Golovkin. And it all depends on who, who you're fighting. I mean, we're talking about a man who, in his eyes, he won his last fight against Sugar Ray Leonard. And when he said he was retiring, he, he stood firm, uh, even though there was offers. So, um yeah, this it's just it's crazy. Um the it's kinda crazy how the fights that define Tommy Hearns are probably the ones that he'd never want to be defined for. It's kinda like Marvin Hagler and Ray Leonard. And it's like he doesn't have a win in those bunches. He fights Ray Leonard the second time. I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone outside of the three judges that think Tommy Hearns didn't win, but it really, really hurts his legacy, the fact that he doesn't have a win over Ray Leonard. Well, you know, early you can say that. Now, um, I mean, I, honestly, look, I probably disagree with you on that, only only because he's a con- he's moved on from that. Yes, he wanted to, to, to fight Sugar Ray Leonard. For, so for eight years, he's had that on his mind. I want to fight Sugar Ray Leonard again really wasn't focused, but he wanted to do – he had his own goals, and it wasn't just to beat Sugar Ray Leonard. He left that fight, and if you look at the press conference after that fight, he dominated the press conference. He had that swagger at that press con- conference as if to say, hey, I won that fight. Sugar Ray Leonard w- was not too vocal at all, period. Later on, years later on the talk show, Sugar Ray Leonard said, as far as I'm concerned, I lost that fight. Tommy Hearns immediately replied years uh, – months later and said, well, when he counted, he didn't say anything. So he moved on from that, and he went on to, you know, finally get that fourth uh, championship uh, opportunity against Juan Rodan, which was a barn burner because he's a tough guy. But like Marvin Hagler was sitting ringside and was commentating, he said, you hurt Juan Rodan, he'll quit. I'm not saying he quit. That right hand had something to do with it. But Tommy didn't stop there. He went from, you know, 160 to 168 to 175, and the rest is history. He made his own mark on, on the sport of boxing. Sugar Ray Leonard, I have a picture, and I want to post it, too. He's working out or he's doing something, and he's wearing a shirt that says Thomas the Hitman Hearns. That shows, and it's not Photoshopped. It, that's a lot of class, man. Well, I think that, like, they they have the uh, – they have so much respect because they spent basically 30 rounds together, you know. And I think that what I see when I look at – um, the two matches is they're they're technically one zero and one, but there was never a third fight, and that's very telling, right? That that they decided not to do a third fight when the first two were so close, and a trilogy would be legendary, but they stop it at two bouts. That kind of tells me that they feel like they're even. Um, yeah, and, uh, sure. Ray Leonard did uh, make a challenge out. You know, he said, "Hey, the third fight." He said that wasn't me that night. Because he was making, well, he was letting the public know, hey, that Sugar Ray Leonard you saw that night was not me. He went on a talk show later on, and he said, hey, I'll win the third time, and I'm going to dedicate it to a special somebody. It never materialized. It never happened. Yeah, it's one of the great things. So he moves up in weight. He goes, he gets his third world title, like you said, against Roldan. No, no, yeah, yeah, actually, no, actually, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, his third world or title. Let me back that up. His third one was against. I'm sorry. He moved all the way up when he when he lost against um, Marvin Hagler. His next fight, he wins by knockout against James Schuler. Okay, but that was an NABF. That yeah, wasn't yeah, like yeah. a world. No, 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 no. Exactly. And then you know, unfortunately, James Schuler passed away. He left the 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 belt there on the casket. So what he did is he moved all the way up to 175. And he took on Dennis Andres. After when he oh, got, and he got the he WBC. Yes, moved all the way up to 175. And he put that weight on correctly. He didn't just put it on any way. He put that on correctly. And he brought the power up there with him in the hand speed. And that then, fight I watched on ABC Live, yes. Uh-huh. So he beat Dennis Andres. 
Then he goes down to middleweight, gets yes. that belt, the fourth yes. belt, the vacant WBC. Yeah. And then he runs into trouble. He runs into his kryptonite, Iran Barkley. Who... Iran the Blade Barkley. Yes. Yeah. So what happens in the first fight between him and Iran Barkley? Oh my gosh. When I think of Iran Barkley, honestly, I think of like, like Nate Diaz. Uh, you know, just that 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 scar tissue. I mean, Tommy Hearns was having his way, was busting him up. He was cutting both eyes. Tommy Hearns landing to the body. And I remember I ran Barkley doing an interview before, and Tommy Hearns was dressed in his suit. You know, hey, we're fighting for the belt. I'm defending against Iron Barkley. I'm Barkley's wearing jeans, a regular T-shirt. You know, and everybody said I ran. What? what what a name, because, you know, back then, you know, I, I don't know who the president was. Was it Reagan or whatever? And we were dealing with Iran. And probably like, Bush. Yeah. Probably Bush. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, maybe probably. Reagan. And they said, well, maybe you're an Iran that everybody likes. And I remember Iran Barkley didn't like that statement. And he said, well, you'll see when we fight at Caesar's Palace. I believe it was outdoor Caesar's Palace. I can't recall. Iran Barkley was not going to be denied, man. He landed the right hand that nobody thought it was going to – nobody thought it was going to happen. I didn't. I was shocked just like everybody else. I was numb. I remember watching it at a friend's house, and uh, I said, I'm going to walk home. I was literally like in disbelief. I was like, oh, my gosh. I, I couldn't believe just what happened because the way he went down. And there was no – that was a great stoppage too because when Tommy got up, he was he was not Tommy Hearns. Had no legs, no nothing left. Yeah, I mean that fight just feels kind of like the Andy Ruiz – to Anthony Joshua, the the Glenn Johnson, the Roy Jones, it feels like the legendary moment. The reason why we watch boxing, just these guys out of nowhere stopping guys. Exactly, and look at the look at the flying connection. I ran Barkley, big knockout win over Thomas the Hitman Hearns. Who's this first title offense against? The one, the only, the hands of stone, Roberto Duran. And it's funny how styles make fights. You would think on paper, okay. I remember when I was younger, a little kid, well, I'm older so I could beat you up. Or my dad, or I, or I didn't have a dad, or, hey, I could beat this guy up. So you would think on paper, hey, Tommy Hearns knocked out Roberto Duran. Man, our Aaron Barkley just knocked Roberto Duran out easy because he beat Tommy Hearns, which was not the case. That's why I respect the 80s and the 90s boxing th- these guys, these legends. And, you know, it's just a pleasure and honor to know that we're talking about one of my favorites, which is Thomas the Hitman Hearns. Yep, and that's he the that, he point that of this series. And able to come back. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's to pay tribute because I'm not going to lie. I got a lot of listeners that are a little on the younger side. And with this free time, it's not like I want to create a platform that doesn't just sound like a bunch of old people saying you need to, you need to know this. This is if you're bored and you're playing Fortnite, just put on this YouTube or put on the podcast version of this. And let it play while you're doing something, and maybe five or six things will stick out. And then may, we have a playlist of my favorite uh, Tommy Hearns fight. And maybe every night or every other night, if you're bored, just go watch a Tommy Hearns fight. Watch the good ones, and then when you get bored of the good ones, watch the early ones. Yeah, that's just the concept of this: is how can we preserve our legends in boxing? Because I don't want a guy like Tommy Hearns to just not be remembered because the people that saw him live. If are too old to tell the story in 40 years like that that would hurt me because this is a guy that gave so much to the sport he deserves a legacy that, that keeps growing I, I agree and any any guys out there that are on google or listen or just upload stuff hey if i'm off by a couple of punches or a date or something go ahead and call me on it man be honest lukey when you send me that hey we're gonna be talking about tommy hearns i'm gonna be honest i i just i didn't look at it it was all from what i knew so I left it out there. It's not that I didn't respect what you sent me. It's just, you know, I, I like to go with what I know. And if I don't know, I'll try to find out because I'm not going to be there here and make an ass out of myself or I'll correct myself later. But, no, to- Tommy Hearns, I mean, just think all the way up to 175. And then to make that weight cut, there was no 168 on the way down until later on in his career, all the way down to 160. That was – and you know what you know what he called that? And, and when, I, when I was talking, I talked to Tommy Hearns about maybe – I want to say two months ago uh, on the Deontay Wilder Tyson Fury uh, fight, he was there. We we spoke, and one thing I wanted to tell him, I wanted, to, I didn't want to talk to him about what everybody else was talking to him. Everybody hit him up about Tommy, about Sherry Leonard, his right hand. I was talking to him about Dennis Andre, and he stopped, and he was giving me his full attention. But I remember when he fought Juan Rodan, he 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 called it 
he said, I'm one mile away from home, which means I'm just one fight away from making history. He goes, I'm one mile away from home. A lot of people didn't know what that meant. When he would go out jogging, he was almost – his last mile, he, coming home, he was almost finished. So that's what he meant. And he got that opportunity, and he seized it, man. He made boxing history that night. So talk to me about the James – so he loses to Iran Barkley, and then he fights James Kinchin. And I didn't actually rewatch this one. This is one that was a very made. close fight. I'm glad you brought that up. So what was this fight like? Well, you know what? James Kitchen, he hurt Tommy Hearns. And we're talking about the old Tommy Hearns chin that, that people were talking about that didn't have a chin. Tommy Hearns got up, and he, he put himself in jeopardy by exposing himself in that you know, usually Tommy Hearns keeps you from the outside, but he he cut he stood in the pocket with James Kitchen, and he just pulled out. You got two guys, and when you got two great athletes, and you got two guys at different levels, one's going to shine. And he went all the way with James Kitchen. James Kitchen made him go to the bank, made him go to the well. That's what he said. He said he made me go to the well, which means all the way down and pull up everything that he has. It was a great fight. A lot of people thought James Kitchen won. If you look at James Kitchen's, uh, if you look at the announcement, you look at his trainer, he's like, what, are you freaking kidding me? What's going on here? Uh, but, you know, hey, when you got two big names, and, uh, you know, we could talk about Kenny Norton, Muhammad Ali, and some of the, the decisions that were given to Kenny, uh, Muhammad Ali, which I thought could have went Kenny Norton's way. You know, I'm not here to step well, on toes. It's just boxing is boxing. That was a very close fight. Could have gone either way, in, in my opinion. I was I was nervous, but Tommy Hearns, he did land the, the most effective punches later on in the fight. And also, it's important to notice that right after that fight happened, he goes into the Ray Leonard rematch, which is a highly profitable fight, which well, could have you, benefited the decision as well. Well, no, well, well, let me tell you. Well, yeah, you're absolutely right, okay, at times. But he's been trying to get Sugar Ray Leonard in there forever, forever. Sugar Ray Leonard wanted no part. But when he recognized something – and Tommy Hearns that night, he said, I'll take the rematch. I'll take it now because he saw something that night. Just like he saw something when John the Beast Mugabe was landing those right hands on Marvin Hagler, he said, I want to fight Marvin Hagler now. Why? Because he saw something that night. On the rematch with, with Roberto Duran, I want to fight him now. Why? He saw something. Not in the fight. He saw something in Roberto Duran's lifestyle after he beat Sugar Ray Leonard. He saw him partying. He saw him out and about. He said he saw him heavy. He said, I want him now. Because he knew the training camp, he was getting a full training camp. He had to cut all this weight, et cetera, et cetera. Sugar Ray Leonard, he's brilliant. When it comes to mind games, people want to talk about Floyd Mayweather. Floyd Mayweather watched Sugar Ray Leonard. As yeah. Jim, and, I'll, and I'll make the same comparison. Jim Carrey watched Robin Williams. So when I'm talking about talent and styles, you know, it has nothing to do with boxing. But somebody inspires somebody. It, it, that's just the way it is. Not to get off, off subject, but Sugar Ray Leonard, he saw a flaw. In that fight, he saw a flaw that night. Sugar Leonard, I mean, Hearns went down on the canvas, got up, witted himself, made it happen, hurt Kitchen. You know, it went back and forth. Tommy Hearns was awarded the fight. Sugar Leonard said, "Let's make it happen now." Now you got to be careful. Win, lose, or draw. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give a comparison to Evander Holyfield. I, I'm gonna say his name, and I'm gonna come back and let you know why. Tommy Hearns has been obsessed with that rematch with Sugar Ray Leonard. It doesn't matter if you look if, if you didn't have any money or you didn't have anything that night. I was gonna come up with money and have everything I need. What I say mean is you could look like a shot fighter because that's what Sugar Leonard was saying. That's why he he drawed that fight and Tommy Hearns bit and said I, I want that fight. There was no way Sugar Ray I mean Tommy Hearns was gonna be denied that fight. He's been obsessed with Sugar Ray Leonard. He's been waiting for that fight and now it's set. And if I finally got that fight because I looked bad. And now you want to fight me? Let's do it. Evander so, Holyfield. Evander Holyfield was he always wanted to fight Mike Tyson. I don't mean to cut you off, Luki. I always wanted wanted to fight Mike Tyson. When Tyson said, "Okay, it just matters up. We're going to fight. It makes sense." Holyfield was ready, and he was Holyfield. Going to that fight was considered a shot fighter. Was the underdog? Not the underdog because it, it's Mike Tyson. The underdog because he looked shot. So back on the Sugar Ray Leonard Tommy Hearns fight. He called out Tommy Hearns. He accepted. Let's do it. And you, and he fought a man that was highly motivated and just was obsessed with that rematch. So he after the Ray Leonard fight, which is ruled a draw, he picks up 
three title defenses, one of which is against Ken Aitken at the Loha Stadium in Honolulu, Hawaii, that I randomly remember because that was like a really big stadium fight and he knocked that guy out. But um, kind of one of the last big Tommy Hearns fights was against Virgil Hill, who was like a merging guy, undefeated guy, getting in there with Tommy and uh, kind of a passing of the torch fight and Tommy Hearns beats him. Well, you got to remember, leading up to that, Virgil Hill was spoiled. He only fought in his hometown, which I, it's not popping in, in my mind right now, but he never traveled to Las Vegas. He never traveled to New York. He never traveled. He was one of those hometown heroes. But, you know, he packed it. You know, and I don't want to use the comparison in any shape or form, you know, if I say Jose Ramirez here at the Mart Center because Jose's plan is to be global and has, uh, willing, was willing and is able to go down to China in New York where he won the belt. So I don't want to get off subject there, but you know what it's like fighting in your own backyard. Virgil I think Hill, he's from uh, North Dakota, right? There you go. There you go. Exactly. He would come in with the two flags on his gloves. Uh, textbook, I believe, silver medalist in the Olympics. Um, you know what? He wanted Tommy Hearns for a while because they, they wanted to have a tournament. It was it was Virgil Hill. It was Dennis Andre. And gosh, who's popping up? Is it Dwight? No, not Dwight Muhammad Kwawi or Matthew Saad Muhammad. Who are these other light heavyweights that aren't popping up? Well, anyways, they, they were going to have a tournament. And Tommy Hearns was in the crowd because they only had champions in there. And Virgil Hill said, no, you get in here. You need to be in here. So when they did that, the public loved it. There was a draw. They made that fight. Tommy Hearns did not have Emmanuel Stewart in the corner for that fight. He had his brother, Billy Hearns. And when they would run up hills, he said, you're running up Virgil Hills. Uh, I mean, the, it's kind of like with Tommy Hearns, what's interesting about him is it's like, the best version of boxing is kind of like these poetic people that are very like, um, I don't know, like they're kind of philosophical and poetic with how they speak. And with Tommy Hearns, there's just so many like poet laureate moments from his training camps where it's like he's so blue collar, but then there's so much artistry in the words he used. Well, I mean, he he's, yeah, you know, I I agree with that. He's very careful about his answers. And if you listen, man, they, they are so – they make so much sense. And, and when I say that, uh, there was a, a reporter that asked Tommy Hearns, hey, is that the hardest right hand you've ever seen? And they were talking about Deontay Wilder. And he said, um, no, is that the best right hand you've ever seen? He, and he said, it's one of the best right hands I've ever seen, but I not, won't necessarily say it is the best. And he wasn't referring to himself because he compared himself. He talked about other uh, heavyweights. He talked about Ernie Shavers. He talked about um, uh, George Foreman. He talked, you know, other people with power. But he's very careful on on his answers. And uh, for that, I respect him. And for that, I I take a lot of what he says because it does make sense. Because other fighters, though, fighters tend to, let's use the word, <laughs> fighters tend to not tell the truth all the time. And Tommy well, fighters... has always, always been true to himself. A lot of fighters, and myself, I'm guilty of this sometimes. If you know someone, you're biased towards who they know, you know, and your fight prediction is based off of do I know this guy or do I know this guy? It's not really you looking at a skill set, right? So it's like you'll get guys, you know, and that's a lot. Of, I'd say that's 80% of when you ask a fighter on camera who do you think is going to win – <clears throat> it's just going to come down to who they know. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You know, I want I want to talk about. You know, I said Tommy Hearns was the first one ever to first fighter to ever win four titles. Well, he was also the first fighter to win five titles. Sure, and Leonard tried to beat him by the opportunity, but Tommy Hearns' his, his fight was uh, before uh, Sure and Leonard's. We all know when Sure and Leonard moved up, and he fought uh, Donnie Golan. At light heavyweight, you know, he tried to win that fifth title. Tommy Hearns was able to be successful in winning a title, uh, you know, James Kitchen, but, but beforehand. Um, what I do want to say about Tommy Hearns, man, is a guy could start his whole career off at 147 and ended at 190 and still was in still great shape in the cruiserweight division. A lot of fighters, they'll put weight on, uh, probably not the proper way. They're still effective, but, but they're not as effective as they can be, uh, you know, James Tony. I ran Barkley later on in their career. You know, I mean, James Tony fought at heavyweight. Tommy Hearns, he put the weight on properly, and he made a run in every division he was in. 
And when I when I said Emmanuel Stewart wasn't in his corner, it's because at that time he uh, he wanted Tommy Hearns to to you know hey let's call it a career, but Tommy Hearns felt that he had some more fight left in him. So Tommy Hearns in '92 fights Iran Barkley again. This is him trying to avenge a previous loss, a split yep. decision. What do you remember about this bout? Man, okay, not only did Tommy Hearns finish the fight with a broken nose, if you look at the fight the very first round, which I don't know why, Tommy Hearns goes right to the ropes and puts his back to the ropes and leans on the ropes. I'm like, what is the game plan on this? I, I just, I, I, it, For the life of me, I couldn't figure it out until I finally said and figured it out, Tommy Hearns cannot outbox Iran Barkley. Sugar Ray Leonard cannot outbox Tommy Hearns. Mike Tyson cannot outbox Evander Holyfield. It just styles make fights. Some people, these guys just got your number. I was pulling for Tommy Hearns. He got the rematch. Uh, he was fired up. He was more than willing. He wanted to erase that loss. I ran Barkley came to fight that night once again. Tommy Hearns, if you look at it at the end of the day, I mean, he, his nose was it was swollen. It was broken that night. And uh, just for him to finish the fight. It was a close fight, but it, it could have been a close fight in Tommy's way. It just... I, I didn't agree with the game plan that night. I was so then, that night. after that, he moves up to Cruiserweight, like you said. He beats Dan Ward, picks up the vacant NABF Cruiserweight title. He beats Lenny Lapigia in 95. He's mostly fighting in Detroit and Vegas. He gets the WBU Cruiserweight title. It's yeah. looking like he's going to make a run at Cruiserweight, and then we get to 2000. And he fights Uriah Grant, who has a very un like an unsexy record of twenty seven and fourteen and he stopped. In Detroit. That that was in Detroit, right? That was in Detroit at the Joe Lewis Arena. Yeah, the yeah, the fight was stopped due to an ankle injury on Tommy Hearns. Yeah, and it's just kinda like it's kind of the classic like I think you've been going for a while, bro. Yeah, it, 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 exactly, exactly. When Tommy Hearns fought in Vegas on that cruiserweight run, he was actually on the undercard, I want to say, of Riddick Bowe and uh, Evander Holyfield. I, I believe it was the night with, with a parachute guy. Because prior to where he hurt himself against Uriah Grant, he had fought a guy named Nate Miller in Manchester, England, and he won unanimously the IBO belt, which some people, not myself included, view as one of the major sanctioning bodies. And that actually took place on a Prince Hamed, Nazim Hamed undercard. So he was the co-main event of that card. And then he followed that up by hurting his ankle. And then he finished his career off in 2005 and 2006 with two knockout wins, both of which, one being in Detroit at an arena, and then he finished it in 2006 at the Palace at Auburn Hills with a knockout of kind of a gatekeeper named Shannon Landberg. The sad part about um, Tommy Hearns' career is, despite being one of the best fighters, he's had financial troubles. He, uh, I, at one point, he owed a quarter of a million dollars to the IRS. And it's just very sad to hear this, that one of the legendary fighters faces a financial burden after all the en- enjoyment and entertainment he provided so many people. I agree. And, you know, he he, he falls where, where a lot of fighters fall, a lot of entertainers fall. Uh, MC Hammer, uh, Mike Tyson at one time before he reinvented himself. And we'll talk about him before we close the show out. Um, you know, and it's unfortunate. You know, and uh, I don't want to say a lot have ended up broke. They just don't have the same cash flow that they should have had and could have had. You, you got some people, uh, again, back in the day, I mean, and even today, okay, looking, you have some guys in fighters' corner that have no business in their corner. Why? Because they're their, their friend's homie or they're a friend of theirs. You have to bring the most important people in your corner. And that talks about even um, your financial corner. You know what I mean? I'm talking about – somebody who's good at numbers, just not, oh, yeah, he's my friend, he's going to handle my account. No. We're talking about paying your taxes for one, making great donations, um, just on top of things. Uh, I'm going to well, be the that... right now who, and who has a great game plan, and, and he has a great uh, – Jose Ramirez. His finances are all in place. He has people doing what they need to do. He has champions all around him that are preferably champions in your accountant, 
your promoter, your manager, um, your trainer, and uh, your, your speed agility coach in Charles Trimley. Back then, they just had friends or people around them that was handling their finances and made some bad investments. A lot of deals were done by word of mouth instead of contracts. Well, I was going to bring up a point, and I think it's important to bring this. All Sure, we had Ali, Foreman, Ray Robinson, and all of that, but up until the 80s, we didn't really have the superstar national attention boxer. We had Ali, who was the superstar, and he had made a lot of money, but we hadn't really had, in my opinion, an era of a lot of great boxers because we didn't really have television. And I think with the 80s and television – brought about the episodic boxer being on the main the mainstream and that's when we found out oh independent contract boxer needs to have more things in place than just the rec center boxing gym a trainer and him hoping he's paying his taxes right no i i, I agree i agree um you know Sarah and Leonard was supposed to be the uh, the paper boy the, not paper with the poster boy, um, you know, to take over everything. And, and he did. He made a good run. I mean, you know, everybody wanted the next Muhammad Ali. You know, unfortunately, like like Larry Holmes, he, he just happened to come back after Muhammad Ali. For a while, I mean, look at um, Steve Young. He he was quarterback after Joe Montana. It wasn't until after he won a Super Bowl that he got some respect. It wasn't until after Ali, uh, Larry Holmes had all those uh, defenses that he got some respect. You know, Sherry Leonard was the man. He he was the face of boxing at that point in time. But I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, we don't have it today, or they didn't have it back then. The faces like the Tommy Hearns, the Burl Durans, and uh, Marvin Hagler's, it's because of today, we don't have the same technology as far as every commercial, every TV, every um, sponsors. A lot of people just knew what they knew. If they came on a talk show or Saturday Night Live, it was like that was a big deal. Now, these guys are on the circuit all the time, different podcasts, diff- different TV shows, different commercials. So you really can't compare the two as far as exposure, as far as marketing, as far as a bank accounts. Back then, a lot of them went broke because there wasn't the big opportunities. You know, so back then, I remember, who, who did Larry Holmes sign with? What, what was it, Pony? He didn't sign with Nike. He didn't sign with Puma. I mean, he signed with Pony. Back then, a lot I of mean, people didn't hear of them. The thing with Larry Holmes, too, was he's like the story of one of the most bitter boxers ever where most of his career is just him talking about he should have gotten more praise. Yeah, I agree with you. I got tired of hearing that after a while, too. It's like, come on, Larry. Like, we get it. You're really good. But if you're if you're just complaining before the buildup to your fight, it's getting real old, man. <laughs> like, Well, there's only one Muhammad, one Muhammad Ali, and, and don't even try to mimic him if you're not going to do a good job of it. Just just be yourself, invent yourself, invent the person that you are. You know, if you didn't get your just do, well, then neither did Marvin Hagler, but he took his career in his own hands, and he went to war with one of the baddest dudes in the world, Tommy Hearns, and after that, he did. He started coming on talk shows. He started getting the commercials and getting the respect that he needed. Yeah, man. So what is the lasting legacy of Tom Thomas, the Motor City Cobra Hearns? Well, you know what? He loves the sport of boxing. He's a great advisory as far as if you were to have a young fighter, let him talk to you. Let Tommy Hearns go in there and talk to you. Let him be a part of, of anything you're doing. But just to get a compliment or, or anything from Tommy Hearns, because he's a people person. He loves he loves the public. Um, what The legacy that he's leaving behind, it, it's, still, it's still valid. And you hear the words, Tommy the Hitman Hearns, I mean, it, it stands for a lot. Just like Sugar Ray Leonard, he's in a special place. He's one of those heads on that on that mountain there that I would put. I would put Hagler, I would put Roberto Grand, Tommy Hearns, Sugar Ray Leonard, and you can you can say argue all day long if he's number one, number two, number three, or number four. It all depends on what day was happening, who he was fighting, and, and what he wanted to do. He was great for the sport of boxing. A legend was able to come back after defeat, was able to reinvent himself and was able to fulfill his goals. Yes, he didn't get the W. His name wasn't called as the winner over Sugar Ray Leonard, and he wanted that. But he was satisfied with his performance, and he, he wanted to be the first man to ever win four world titles. And he accomplished that, and he was able to be the, the first win five. He's still very much involved in the sport of boxing. 
Uh, I talked to him on the Deontay Wilder uh, Tyson Fury undercard. They brought him in. The WBC brought him in. Why? Because he's a legend. Why? Because a lot of people compared his right hand to Deontay Wilder's. And, you know, a lot of people can, but it, until Tommy Hearns talks to you about it, he ta- he'll he agree to a point, but <laughs> he's not ready to say, okay, yeah, exactly. Tommy Hearns had great balance for, for uh, his lanky, for his, for his height. Well, and he was a combination puncher. So yeah, it's yes, like he his right hand came, but you have the left hook to the body, and then he'd follow up. Like, Wilder throws one punch, and then he can't follow in succession. Hearns had a great right hand, but he threw in combination. Well, exactly. See, Wilder would aim the right hand all day long. Tommy Hearns had other punches to what, uh, Lukey? To set the right hand up. He had that jab to set the right hand up. He had that feint. He had that left hook to the body, which I I got overlooked. Tommy Hearns has a beautiful left hook. And if you watch that fight, Tommy Hearns and Kieran Lennon the rematch, you'll hear Marvin Hagler come to Tommy Hearns has a beautiful left hook. He's not throwing it. He was beautiful left hook. And and you'll hear Marvin Hagler. Yeah, I mean, actually, he's going for Tommy Hearns. Tommy Hearns has a great left hook. And you know what? He's good for the sport of boxing. I think that, to me, the impact Tommy Hearns has is I think Tommy Hearns made a lot of fans to boxing because he's one of the most entertaining action fighters ever. And he's a great ambassador of the sport. And he's an iconic figure that I think a lot of people, myself, yourself included, when you watch a Tommy Hearns fight, it's not like any other type of fight. It's a special type of fight because it's like there's ebbs and flows, there's drama, there's there's different elements of boxing. And even if you don't understand it, you understand that it's special. So he boxes in fights, he goes to war, he might get dropped, someone else might get dropped everything is exaggerated and everything is so much larger and bigger. And I guess at the bare essence, it's saying he's the true main event fighter. Whereas most of Tommy Hearns fights are just, even if he's in a mismatch, it's just going to be that much bigger than someone that isn't as skilled. Well, watching his fight, win, lose, or draw, wherever he was in the fight, you knew he had that shot. You knew he had that opportunity. Well, you knew he had that, if he lands that right hand, he could change things in a blink of an eye. I'll tell you a quick story before we go. You know where the bar is at NGM Grand, right? That main bar right there. Mm-hmm. Up, I finish, and just like you, I know you. I know, I, you know, I saw you in Vegas, and, it, and I'm passing by, you're passing by. It's not that we ignored each other. You were working, I was working. Long story short, He's coming from the elevator, which, you know, you got to – when you come from the elevator, Lukey, if you remember, you got to pass the, – In the – there's the pond, and then there's that little yes. bar with the $10 corona. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, you, he right – get to the bar, right, where they have – you know, they got a sign there, and they got an entrance to the bar, which is the lounge. I'm sitting there at the bar, and I see Tommy Hearns, and somebody says, who is that? I said, are you kidding me? I gave this young person a hard time. I said, hey, do your history. That's Thomas Hayman Hearns. So he runs down there. Everybody recognizes who he is. He's taking baby steps. He's signing everything they give him. He's taking all these pictures. I'm at the bar. I'm on beer number two or three. I go out there to, to, to use the restroom. He's barely maybe by the store on your way out. There with a swarm of people. He's still there. He can't even get out of MGM Grand. People are swarming him, taking pictures, autographs, talking to him. He's taking baby steps. He has his posse around. Well, you know, we had two people around him. But you just see a crowd of people because they recognize and they respect who Thomas the Hitman Hearns is, a.k.a. Motor City Cobra. Okay, so let me contextualize what I hear from that, too. We look at some of these modern fighters, right, and you hear pushback. Like, I think, like, a guy like Earl Spence is a guy that a lot of people have pushback. He's done some great things, but people want to see the big fight, right? Mm -hmm. And Tommy Hearns might not have ever won the quote-unquote big, big fight, but he took the big fights, and they sure did mean a lot to the fans. And I think as he gets older, he's rewarded because people sure do love him, and they remember him because he was a big part of their life. You know, they said on the on their calendar, I want to see Tommy Hearns fight on this day against Ray Leonard or Marvin Hagler or against Wilfred Benitez or Iran Barkley. Like they said on a calendar, we got to watch this date. This is going to be an awesome fight. 
And I worry that some of these modern fighters, that they're going to be in a rude, a rude awakening because they might get skipped by this next generation of Gabe Flores Jr., of Mark Castro, of Ryan Garcia, Shakur Stevenson, all these young fighters who are willing to step up and it feels like they want to challenge themselves. There might be a whole generation of the Crawford, Spence, Lomachenko, that they're remembered slightly, but they're not going to be remembered or beloved like this next generation. That, there's there's two mindsets to that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You have to fight the the toughest fighter to be great. Yes, Tommy Hearns came up short to his two biggest fights. Three, the first one was Sherry Leonard, the rematch Sherry Leonard, and Marvin Haggard. Those are the biggest fights that he did not get the W in. The when you got the, the Ryan Garcias, I mean, they need the tanks. They need the Gabriel Floreses. They need the fighters in their era and their weight classes. They need, they, need to, they need to fight each other. Will it happen? It's probably not because you don't just have one promoter now. You don't just have one governing body now. You have different governing bodies. You got mandatory. It, it's business, and I understand the business. I really do. I understand the business. You have to make your fighter, give him a living, put him at risk at times, and ask yourself, do you dare to be great? So I, I do see the, that's a great, that's a great analogy, uh, Luki. And also, I thought you missed you missed uh, Lopez on that. Be a female, put him in that. Well, match. I mean, yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, I was just kind of spitballing. I yeah, mean, no, like, no, no, no. I hear you. I hear you. But yeah, I don't. I, I mean, I don't want these guys to get overlooked. Because back then, I mean, you had no choice but to fight who was in front of you, and those were the names. And we've been blessed because we have a lot of potential Tommy Hearns. We have a lot of potential Sugar Ray Leonard's and Roberto Duran's and Julio Cesar Chavez is now. Everybody has the potential to be great, but do they dare themselves to be great to put themselves at risk? The one guy that I see him, and I'm not a big get on a bandwagon type, the one who dares himself to be great, correct me if I'm wrong, is Carnelo Alvarez. Because even no, though I mean, he's a golden boy, he says, I want the toughest fight. I want legacy. I want to be a legend. I have the belt, but I want more. No, I agree with you on that, but I'll, I'd say it's like him and Tyson Fury right now. Lomachenko is doing it as well, but the problem with Lomachenko is it's like he did it, but he he's kind of like he hasn't had the fight where we've kind of really gotten excited as the public. Like he's fought really good opposition, but he's never found himself on pay-per-view. And in a sport where it's, like, all about demand, I went to his fight against Miguel Mariaga, and it wasn't in the Staples Center. It was in the Microsoft Theater, which is much smaller. So it's, like, you look at some of these guys. Terrence Crawford had one pay-per-view – no, I think two pay-per-view fights, and they didn't do tremendous. It's just – it's these guys – like, with a guy like Crawford, I'd love to see Crawford fight Jerome Bucinis a guy out there, right? That's a great fight if that could ever get made. And that's what these guys who are the stars right now need. They need that big fight with another guy where people doubt it. And we could say Victor Postal was that guy or whatever, but clearly they're not that guy because the public opinion didn't shift enough. When you beat the guy, all of a sudden, look at perfect example. When Tyson Fury did what he did to Deontay Wilder the first time, everyone wanted a piece of Tyson Fury in the general public. Everyone's like, yo, this guy's for real. And that's what happened when you beat the guy. And that's why Tommy Hearns is the way Tommy Hearns is. <laughs> hey, because, let me say, let me, yeah. hey, let me say something about Tyson Fury real quick. And, and you know, I mean, you, especially you, Luki, you meet, these, you meet these motherfuckers before they become champions or contenders. You meet them right out the amateurs, okay? You do. So I watched Triple G before everybody wanted to be Triple G. I watched Tyson Fury when he fucking got his ass knocked down on ABC Sports on on, on Steve on Cunningham Ty- exactly, and I said, I, you know why I loved him? Because he didn't care, and I loved his nickname. That is a cold nickname, the Gypsy King. And now everybody's on his dog, everybody's on this and that. But at the end of the day, they should be, because he's the greatest thing since peanut butter and jelly right now. He is. Might, what he, says he is. Might be the best heavyweight since Mike Tyson and Muhammad Ali. And well I don't there. even I, I, I don't I, feel I, like I, that's I, an exaggeration. I, I no, I agree with you there. He I might beat Ali, and I know people will get mad at me for saying that, but he poses a serious threat to Ali in his prime. Yeah, okay. Hell that I'm gonna say it right now. There was a lot of heavyweights that could have beaten Ali. Plain and simple period. Ali was great for what he stood for, 
He put himself in danger and fought everybody, and he backed up what he said. And most of all, he fought the freaking the USA Army Force. He fought everybody when there was victims out there that needed the hostages. Who did they go to? Muhammad Ali, because he was the greatest public figure of all time, period. Muhammad Ali was bigger than boxing, was bigger than the president, was bigger than, and I don't care if you get upset, was bigger than the Pope. Muhammad Ali left a legacy. Was he able to get beat? Yes, he did get beat. He got beat by Leon Spinks. So you want to tell me that nobody else is going to have a great night that night like Leon Spinks did? Tyson Fury can. Mike Tyson can. Deontay Wilder can. But Muhammad Ali was great. He showed his greatness by beating George Foreman when a lot of people thought he was crazy, thought he would be a victim of getting knocked out. And he wrote the blueprint on how to beat the rope adobe, he called it, how to beat George Foreman. So Muhammad Ali is just a man, but what he stood for was much greater. He is a legend, a public figure, and can never, ever be denied. And I, I think that's why, in my opinion, and uh, now we're going a little off current and we're about to be done, is my when people ask who are the greatest fighters, I always say Ray Robinson is one, uh, Ali is number two, and then we start my list at three. Because Ray Robinson invented modern boxing, and if it wasn't Ray Robinson, we wouldn't have modern boxing. So he has to be number one for for what his contribution I like was. Armstrong. I like Armstrong, too. Okay, so that, I guess you could make a case for Armstrong as well. But I, in my bias list, it's Ray Robinson. And then I put Ali second because it's like he was a champion in and out of the ring. And that, that's applauded on my list, is that he was a champion in and out of the ring. So it's it's... Those two on my all-time greatest list, you can't. You're gonna have. I'm gonna have a lot of resistance to move those guys hey, away. Hey man, I'm gonna say a name right now, okay? Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, Pele. Uh, what's another freaking legend? I just had one right now. Wayne Gretzky, uh, Babe Ruth. There's only a few freaking names that are just freak. They're legends, bro. Plenty but like experience. the thing with Ali to me, why like I anyone that knows me, I wear a lot of Ali clothing in my personal life, is that he stood for a public platform to try to help others, and rarely do athletes ever really stand up for other people, and he he did it to not make a profit. Yes, he, he did. literally gave away the prime of his boxing career to try to stand up for other people. And that's something that, like, no matter what anyone says about Ali, he gave up his best years of boxing to help others. Yes, he did. And a a lot of things, what I always remember about him, since we were bringing up the greatest of all time, is he wanted to sign every autograph that was sent to him. And after he he would do a magic trick, I never met the man. I, I, you know, I was never able to have the privilege and honor of meeting the great Muhammad Ali. But whenever he would perform a magic trick, what people didn't know is afterwards he told you how he performed the trick because he didn't want to leave any trickery in your mind. He didn't want to leave you with that thought because of his belief, you know, and I respected that. It's like if I do a trick and you're going, man, Richard, how do you do that? Or whatever. And I'll say, look, this is how I did it. He did that off camera or, you know, let me just show you what I did. And, and hearing that story from his wife, Camille, I, I just – it's just remarkable. I mean, I, you know, it's Muhammad Ali's Muhammad Ali, plain and simple, period. It's just like what scares me and why I like doing this series and then we'll wrap up is you listen about Muhammad Ali or even a guy like Tommy Hearns, right? Blue collar guy. Worked his butt off, became a legend. Sure, he made a lot of money, but a lot of it was about I want to be remembered as great. And I worry that some of our modern fighters are about I want to be rich. And I feel like that's a lot of what the world is now. Eh, it's okay if we make like a decent product. Maybe it'll suck, but let's just get really rich. And that there's a there's a there's a lack of pride in what people produce, or a lack of pride in being a good fighter. How many times do you hear someone go, um, "Well, I'm not sure if he's good, but I know we can make a lot of money with him." Back in the day with these Tommy Hearns and these Ali's, the money was gonna be there because they're really good, but it was about they wanted to have a legacy. 